We're talking comics, games, and collectibles with Tim Broman, co-owner of Collector's Connection, and Ryan Fleming, owner of Rogue Robot in Duluth, Minnesota. Two of you represent 30 years, 40 years of the history of comics in Duluth, is that right? I am Ryan Fleming. I am owner and management of Rogue Robot Games and Comics in downtown Duluth. Whew, I worked at Collector's Connection for 10 years and also did a lot of internet dealing for comics and collectibles on eBay, Amazon. Also did a lot of table shows around the local area, Duluth, the city, stuff like that. And now we've had our own shop open, Rogue Robot, for, I think, just four months now, actually, just happened. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And congratulations to you and your long history. Yes. That goes to show that people who say that it can't last for one of those stores is dead wrong. So. Yeah. Just didn't have any better options. <laughs> so if we go back uh, to, what, the 1960-something? Yeah, Small for me. Roman. Yeah. You're buying comics where? Uh... <laughs> Well, I gotta remember, I'm the I'm the fourth of four children, so my first exposure to comic books were whatever the leftovers were from the older siblings. So a lot of um, back then Harvey comics, Richie Rich, Sad Sack, Spooky, and Casper the Friendly Ghost. But the local stores were Nelson's Pharmacy on 19th Avenue East and Superior Street and down in Duluth, which is now the amazing Alonzo uh, Paperback Exchange, and uh, Avenue Market over on 14th Avenue East and Fourth Street, which is now the Burrito Union. That was where I got my comic books. And back in the day, DC comic books were the only ones that were available. I didn't even know Marvel Comics existed until I left the state on vacation. Discovered them in Florida. But I used to read, uh, when it was time for me to pick my own books, I always liked the DC team ensembles. The Teen Titans, the Legion of Superheroes, the Justice League of America. Stuff like that, that's what I got into. Uh, when I started reading, I was eight. My dad, out of nowhere, just said, I'm going to take you um, to a newsstand, and we're going to go get comics. And I was kind of excited and thrilled because I had no idea what I was going to expect when I saw it. And he took me down on Grand and West Duluth. I'm trying to remember the name of it. The shop. West, West End News? West yeah, News? that's right. West Duluth News, yeah. Yep. should be able to remember that. It's easy enough, right? And then oh. there's that music store there. And he let me pick out as many comics as I wanted, and he ranted and raved how he couldn't believe they were a dollar because when he was a kid, they were 12 cents. Um, then I took them home, pretty much read them, and right away my OCD, even as a child, kicked in and put each one in a Ziploc bag under my bed. And after that, I, he would take me there every once in a great while, so I didn't have any issues that came right after each other. He'd be like, a few months would go by, and he would take me again. And then it wasn't until, like, years later, when they closed, that I found out that there was such a place as a store that specialized in selling comics, not just newspapers and magazines and stuff like that. And that was Collector's Connection in downtown Duluth where the Technology Center is now. Um, and then, I don't know, I've just been reading them ever since, and then I started hunting them down myself once I finally got, started getting a paycheck when I was 15. Yeah, when I started with comic books, they were 12 cents a piece. And my every every two weeks, I'd get a quarter from my mom. And I would go to the usually the Avenue Market, because my grandmother and grandfather lived across the avenue from the from the Avenue Market. So I go over there and I buy two 12 cent comic books and have enough money left over for two pieces of double bubble gum. And then I discovered banana flips. Uh oh. So that's 12 cents too. So <laughs> I get one comic book and a banana flip. What's a banana flip? It's a cake. It's a snack cake thing that used to be made by a local bakery. Oh, okay. It's I, a, I've heard of them. I never had one. It's a, apparently, it's a lost art. <laughs> Tim, you need to open a new shop and only sell banana And lose flips. some weight. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, you didn't actually set out to work in comics initially. You, want, you wanted no. to work in a newsstand? Or oh, you... hell no. When I started, I was working at the time. I mean, I've been in the glorious trade of retail all, almost all of my adult life. I've worked for F.W. Woolworth. I worked for Schneider Drug downtown. And at the time, I was working for Granada News. I'd been working for Granada News for like 12 years at this point. Kevin Bergson, the guy who used to run the comic shop in Fargo, um, was uh, was telling me all about this new comic shop that opened over down the block. And so I go over to this little store on the corner, and literally this thing is 600 square feet, which is probably not much bigger than your, your living room and your kitchen put together. And the front of the store has a couch on the one side with a, with a coffee table in front of it, and on the other side there's a couple of glass cases and a big old cash register behind the counter, and then the back of the store is wide open, big enough you could play racquetball back there if you wanted to. And so I walked in, and there was a Mike Fergon was working there at the time. I think Laura Marquardt was there. 
And so I left and I went across the street and I was waiting for my bus to go home and I'm thinking to myself, six months. I'll give him six months and then he'll be done. So what do I know? I, I always wanted to work in comics right away when I first discovered them as a kid. I either wanted to draw them or I wanted to sell them. And I went to school, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, to draw comics. And I don't know, I still love drawing stuff, but I, I discovered that that was just not for me. But uh, So I went to work at Collector's Connection, worked there for 10 years. Um, now you were hired by the downtown store. Yep, the downtown by Steve. Yep, by Steve. And then Steve came up to the mall store, because that's where I was. Mm -hmm. And he said, we just hired a kid, which means I got no hours for this guy. Can you use him? And at the time, we were looking for a part-timer, and I said, sure. So uh, so I, I never hired Ryan myself. He came up through Steve, through the downtown store. And then uh, and that's how we got started. And boy, were you lucky. The first day I was there, I wore a tie. <laughs> I had a dress shirt and a tie. And people would come to me and say, who died? Yeah. And where are you going after this? Because you're all dressed up. What do you do? It's like it's like the last time I ever wore a tie to Collector's Connection. It's a t-shirt and jean business. Basically. Yeah. You're not uh, you're not dressing to a you're not dressing for bankers. You're dressing for you know 14 year olds. I think they almost don't trust you if you are dressed up because you don't seem like one of them, you know, or right. one of us, I should say. I got to be yeah. honest with you. I wasn't at that stage of my life. I wasn't one of them. I mean, yeah. I read comics as a kid, but. Yeah. But, you know, by the time I was 14, none of my friends were doing it. My friends weren't collecting baseball cards. They weren't reading comic books. They were into, I don't know, beer and pot and whatever. And that wasn't where I wanted to be. But I got rid of, I had a collection of baseball cards. I had a collection of comic books. I had a collection of wrestling magazines. I got rid of two out of three. Guess which one I kept? Kept the wrestling magazines. Yeah. No, I didn't waste your time with that. But, uh, yeah, the comic books wound up in a bag, wound up in a rummage sale. I got two bucks for them, and I was happy. The baseball cards I wound up giving to my nephew, who gave to my uncle, who may still have them in his collection. I don't know about that. I know my uncle's moved a couple times. So. Yeah, I always wanted to um, collect as a kid, but I didn't know what to collect. I collected all kinds of weird things like sports cards, even though I didn't like sports. And I collected pencils that were unsharpened and had different designs or carvings in them. And then Interesting. finally, yeah, I know, weird, weird hobbies. And then mm -hmm. I finally uh, picked up comics and really loved that and knew that I wanted to be a part of that. And I remember that I would go to the downtown store all the time and be like, give me a job, I want a job, which is the worst thing you can do if you want someone to hire you is to go in every day and say, I want a job. That's, that's what I always thought because it seems kind of pushy and irritating, irritating but maybe not. Well, you, you got a job. I, so. Well, the reason I got a job, though, is because they finally said, well, you know what, we'll let you work for us for the weekend while we try to move this store because they were going to tear down that, that shop and put in the technology. Oh, yeah. Center. So I came and I helped you guys, and I guess that's I worked hard saying. enough, and also it, did, it helped, too, that... One of his daughter's teachers was my mom's best friend, and she put in a real good word for me, and then go. I got that job. And then after I left Collector's Connection to go to school, I started selling stuff online all the time, like eBay um, and doing the shows. And I had a real knack for being able to pick out what comics were going to be bigger a month down the line. Because, you know, comics, they have that spike. They go up, and then they, go, then they come back down a little bit. And I normally had, you know, I was wrong once in a while, but I had a pretty good knack at finding that out. So I always did good at those shows. And then finally there was this shop downtown that I was a judge for Heroclix. And I heard that they were, you know, out of money. They were going to shut down. And I always wanted to have my own shop, but I always felt like the economy wasn't right. And it probably still isn't, but it was such a good opportunity that I had to take it because I knew I would never get an opportunity like this again to get um, as many fixtures and uh, product to to get it at such a cheap level. And then I brought in a whole bunch of my own collection, like 20 long boxes, and I don't know how many boxes of action figures, and and I don't know how many crates of hero clicks. And then Leah, and also, who is my manager, she had a lot of magic cards that were ready to be sold, and we also got a lot of magic cards that were ready to be sold. Probably not as many as the other ones that we got, but she did have some. She's got a good knowledge of it. And then we opened up Rogue Robot, and it's been going pretty well the last four months. So Now, you talk about Leah, but the people listening to the podcast don't know who Leah is. Leah is my girlfriend, and she's also my manager. And she is pretty much the one who the business would pretty much just drown if she wasn't here. So okay. <laughs> she, she does all the work, and I take all the credit. Okay. It's pretty fun. Now, I will ask this question because uh, you mentioned eBay. You sell on eBay. I sell on eBay. I use eBay mostly for white elephant stuff, mm -hmm. um, the stuff that hasn't sold. I mean, it's time to put it on the shelf and get, you know, get what you can for it and move it along. 
Um, do you sell on any other outlets other than eBay from the internet? Do you sell on Amazon or Craigslist? Right now, we don't sell on the internet at all, but we have plans to. But okay. right now, like we're only been open for four months. I don't feel that four months is a long enough time to give up on a product that is here. Mm -hmm. I agree. We, I'm leaning like more towards six months. I've, I know Leah thinks that maybe a year would be the soonest we should do it. But I mean, I don't know. If I don't see much interest in something, I'll put it on on the internet. Uh, I have a lot of history with that. I got a 100% approval rating on eBay. So mm -hmm. good for you. Yeah. So we should be like, but right now, yeah, we haven't done much of anything on there yet. We, I have plans to do it if things don't sell. But right now, like I said, only four months. I don't feel like it's time to start putting stuff up yet. Do you sell on any other sites? Do you use Amazon or Craigslist? I did use Amazon before I had my own shop and I was selling stuff. Craigslist, I don't like to use because you get all kinds of different kind of people. Well, most of the time, it's good, but sometimes you get that one person that you really wish you hadn't. Um, contacted so yeah. and you uh, I do eBay um, we have an Amazon account I use Craigslist to promote events but I don't use it to sell items um, given the current news media uh, frenzy about uh, there was a guy was it in the Twin Cities that got tasered by somebody who's trying to sell a computer at a, at a restaurant. I remember. And yeah. and he got tasered. It was like a million volt taser or something like that. It was a it was an awful. Uh, he suffered some pretty serious injuries. Um, so Craigslist is a real caveat emptor. But for the most part, eBay and Amazon, uh, we don't sell through our own website uh, or we don't use other sources currently. That may change in the future. It just depends on how things go. I mean, other than eBay, there's a lot of other companies out there that try and do the same kind of thing. Ubid.com is one of them. And there's, a, there's quite a few more others, but I haven't seen one that really stands out. So You're both pretty dependent on Facebook. Yep. Social mm -hmm. media. I don't Twitter. Do you Twitter? No. Okay. Twittering might be another way to go for, I mean, I'm, I'm looking into a Twitter account, but I don't even own the cell phone, so that kind of makes it hard. What's kind of interesting is Twitter is supposed to be this big thing. I don't know one person who has a Twitter account. I don't know a single person, none of my friends, family, or my customers, at least they don't tell me they don't. They all talk about Facebook, but they never talk about Twitter. See, now, now to be honest with you, okay, well, since we're doing a podcast, my Facebook account is called Collector's Connection Duluth, Minnesota. Yours is called? Yeah, we're Ro excuse me, Rogue Robot Games. Okay. So. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I actually announced on Facebook I had a Twitter. I had one person respond with, a, with you know, here, here's my Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was kind of hoping if I could get a significant number, maybe two dozen, three dozen people, to hit back with uh, with uh, with uh, Twitter feeds, I might use that as, a, as another way to promote items. But like he says, I haven't run into a lot of success with that yet. Probably doing it wrong, but yeah. but you have to start somewhere, I guess. It seems like Twitter is more for just a thought that popped in your head, you know, mm -hmm. like to just say something that popped in your head. And I don't really feel that that necessarily benefits my, my business unless I wanted to use it for advertising, saying stuff like, hey, we just got in the uh, deluxe hardcore edition of Hush. Uh, Batman series mm -hmm. but in actuality I can do that on Facebook too and on Facebook I can also post all of our events because we have events every day My, like Sunday to Saturday there's a, something going on at Rogue Robot and some nights there's three things going on at Rogue Robot like tonight we had you know three we had a tournament we had D&D &D, and we had magic today and I can put all those up there for the events on the calendar and then I can also blast on Facebook hey don't forget we got these going on today much like I would have done on Twitter, but except it's all rolled into one. So. To learn more about our hosts, visit those Facebook pages. Look forward to more podcasts in the future.